Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is a very long-term chart of the U.S. dollar versus the Japanese yen. Uh, I actually took a position long the Japanese yen. It's a Japanese yen. South African ran across, but nevertheless, I'm long the Japanese yen uh, through that. And uh, as you can see, if you look at the long-term chart, uh, the long-term picture here is... Uh, the the dollar is in a downtrend against the yen you can see we're basically talking a move from 300 down to 100 that's pretty much what it was although it hit as low as uh, 80 you can see but for the most part since about 1977 and that's really if you remember back in the 70s you had the term jap metal and uh in the beginning when the japanese first tried to get into the export uh, industry and Jimmy Rogers has a very good summary of it uh, of what the Japanese went through in the 70s but basically the Japanese started off with cheap chintzy products called jap metal products and then uh, they started to break into some electronics and then they did tools and and we know the story they basically took over the television and car markets and it and they did it through quality and that's what you have to do when you're a uh, basically on a rock you know you don't really have a lot of natural resources uh, you, you don't really have anything except the ability to uh, produce something and produce a better value than your competitors that's exactly what the Japanese did now unfortunately in uh, the 80s and 90s the Japanese followed the US model of hyperinflating their stock and bond markets and of course then they crashed them and, and they've never really recovered since but uh, a lot of people consider the Japanese to be one of the sickest economies in the world and it may be I actually consider the US to be it just hasn't come out yet and you can actually see that in this long-term chart uh, the fact of the matter is is that since the Japanese started their serious technological boom and export boom the United States dollar has lost two-thirds of its value against the Japanese yen and you can see this trend is resuming and I fully expect it to make new lows, actually. And the reason why I shorted the yen when I did is because I saw it was coming up this trend line. And I'm sorry, shorted the dollar yen when I did is because it was coming up to this trend line. And actually, I think the Japanese, believe it or not, are actually in a better fiscal position than we are. What does that say about us? So this one I'm going to label uh, billionaires and barrios because I'm going to talk about these uh repercussions of this Panama thing and the billionaires and and all the things that are going on now the first thing I want to look at here is this video from Jeff Berwick and Luke Radowski of We Are Change and it's an interesting video uh, I don't agree politically with Luke Radowski I don't agree politically with Jeff Berwick actually um, I think Luke Radowski is kind of on the left kind of an Occupy Wall Street type of guy and I think that Berwick is an anarcho-capitalist just too far anarchist for me uh, but they're both interesting individuals and they have an interesting take now this is a picture of a barrio in Venezuela and I've covered Venezuela a lot and uh, and I think Berwick says in this that he would attribute about 80 percent or 90 percent of what's happened in Venezuela to the Venezuelan government I would say more uh, the left tends to think that, well, the U.S. is undermining them. No, they've done a good enough job on their own undermining themselves. I would put it about 95% of the cause of the problems in Venezuela are to, due to their socialist government, uh, a bunch of lunatics down there. But watch this video. It's a very interesting video. Now, I wanted to touch briefly on this uh, national debt clock uh, silver and gold thing before I do that I want to look at the real national debt because this is the one that I cover all the time uh, I've pointed out this 18151152 figure that goes for a long ways and it's my expectation actually now I'm just gonna make a projection I think before we reach uh, it's gonna be October of this year I predict we will be at a two trillion dollar deficit according to this. Now we're at 18152 a year ago and right now we're at 19237. So we're about 1.1 trillion dollar deficit, but again, it has to stay the same all the way through October and I predict it's going to rise. 
so let's get to that debt clock and look at that gold silver uh, addition that they've made. So this this is something that's always expanding. I do love this uh, national debt clock thing. This, the ticking clock here is really kind of stupid because they just constantly adjust it. And obviously this federal budget deficit is a joke. At $493 billion, it's more than double that. But uh, they're going off of official figures. So let's look at these gold and silver figures they've added here. You can see you've got these new ones, a dollar to gold ratio 1913, dollar to gold ratio now, dollar, uh, silver to gold, uh, uh, dollar to silver ratio 1913, silver, uh, dollar to silver ratio now. Now what are they talking about? How are they calculating it? Well, the first thing you want to look at here, I think, is the uh, gold to silver ratio based on what they say here. And you can see this is about what is it, almost 100 to 1? That's kind of crazy. But, you know, how do they calculate this? What are they calculating? Well, you can see U.S. dollar to, oh, that's iron ratio. I'm sorry, let me get the uh, silver ratio. U.S. dollar to silver ratio, the year-over-year year over year increase in the M2 money supply divided by the yearly production of silver in ounces. I can't get that to stay on the screen, but you can see it's up at the top of the screen right now. And same thing for gold. That's the year-over-year -year increase in the M2 money supply divided by the yearly production of gold in ounces. Now, how meaningful is that? Uh, well, it's an estimate that all of the money that the M2 money supply increased would all go into gold and silver. Well, we know we've already covered the issue of investment demand for gold, silver, and the mining shares. Traditionally, it's run 10% of a portfolio. That's actually the Wall Street recommended traditional allocation of a safe portfolio. Uh, we're down around 1%, so we need to move tenfold from here. So just based on that, the price, a fair price for silver would be $150, and a fair price for gold would be $12,000. But... Uh, how meaningful is this? Well, it's not really meaningful at all because the issue is not how much the money supply has grown, but the issue is how much of that money can flow into that asset. And I've already covered the fact that the billionaires are not allowed to put their money into it. Uh, so what can the billionaires put their money into? Well, I think the cryptocurrencies is going to be one that they probably are going to do as well. You can see uh, Bitcoin is now around 6.25 billion. Uh, let's do them by market cap. Ethereum comes in at about 800 million. Ripple is about 250 million. Litecoin is around 150 million. And then Capricoin, Augur, Storage, Dash, MadeSafe, Doge, Monero, etc. But the whole total comes to about 8.65 billion. Again, an absolute pittance. That's somewhere where they can put their money. Now, they're breaking this story here on the billionaires, and this is this Panama Papers silliness. And uh, any of you who have been in the alternative news community or the conspiracy community, we know that all of the politicians of the world are compromised and that they're bribed and that they have all this money and most of it they hide. They don't pay taxes. We had uh, tax avoiding Timmy Geithner. I mean, I can't even go through all of these corrupt politicians. But this story on the Panama Papers uh, is a very suspicious story. So we're going to get to that and close with that. But before we do, I want you to look at this story from Zero Hedge about this David Tepper. And this is really interesting because the debate that's going on right now is uh, uh, the socialist um, candidate who's running against Hillary is arguing that we just need to raise taxes. And so Bernie Sanders says that if we just raise taxes, we can solve all our problems. Hillary Clinton Basically, she'd just make me president and you'll find out what I'll do. Sort of like, uh, uh, what's her name? Um, the one who said, pass the Obamacare and you'll find, pass the bill and you'll find out what's in it. So Hillary's not really involved. Now, 
Trump on the other side, he's kind of like a money guy. He is a billionaire. Uh, does he take the side of the billionaires? I'm not really sure. Probably. But this story is very interesting because this is an example of what happens when you try to tax the billionaires. This David Tepper, let me read the story. Over the past several months, the recurring story of hedge fund billionaires taking leave of their home states and heading to tax-friendly Florida has led various pundits to focus on the deteriorating fiscal state of hedge fund-heavy Connecticut, where, as we reported recently, credit risk surged to record high following a disappointing bond auction. And there's the Connecticut bond yield. As we reported at the time, the likely culprit was the state's $550 million general obligation sale on March 17th, which included debt due in 2026 that priced to yield 2.52% compared with an expected 2.37% based on Bloomberg's Connecticut index. The state's Office of Policy and Management said last week that the budget deficit for the current fiscal year is $131 million, an increase of $111 million from the prior month's estimate. The ongoing hedge fund exodus as billionaires leave for states where their money is treated better will only make things for Connecticut worse. Now, another state is in the crosshairs following the imminent extatiation of prominent hedge fund billionaire Appaloosa David Tepper. As Bloomberg reports, the decision by billionaire hedge fund manager David Tepper to quit New Jersey for tax-friendly Florida has put the Garden State in fiscal peril and could complicate estimates of how much tax money the struggling state will collect. The head of the legislature's nonpartisan research branch warned lawmakers. That's right. One person can make or break the precarious fiscal balance of New Jersey. According to Bloomberg, Tepper, 58, registered to vote in Florida in October, listed a Miami condominium as his permanent address, and in December filed a court document declaring that he is now a resident of the state. On January 1st, he relocated his Appaloosa management from New Jersey to Florida, which is free of personal income and estate taxes. His move has put New Jersey state officials in a state of near panic. Quote, we may be facing an unusual degree of income tax forecast risk. Frank Haynes, budget and finance officer with the Office of Legislative Services, told a Senate committee Tuesday in Trenton. The reason for the panic is that New Jersey relies on personal income taxes for about 40% of its revenue, and less than 1% of taxpayers contribute about a third of those collections. According to the Legislative Services Office, a 1% forecasting error in the income tax estimate can mean a $140 million gap, Haynes said. Tepper's departure is unexpected. He has lived in New Jersey for more than two decades, initially as an executive at Goldman Sachs, where he helped run junk bond trading during the late 1980s and early 1990s, and then after founded Appaloosa in 1993. His fortune is estimated at $10.6 billion, according to Bloomberg Billionaires Index. That makes him the wealthiest person in New Jersey, or rather, made him. But the worst news is for New Jersey residents who already bear the country's third highest tax burden. According to the Tax Foundation in Washington, along with the nation's highest property taxes, it's one of two states that levy both an estate tax on the deceased and an inheritance tax on the heirs. The income tax rate for top earners is 8.97%. Democratic legislators have repeatedly passed a millionaire's tax that would increase the levy to 10.75%, but Republican Governor Chris Christie has vetoed it each time. With Tepper's departure, Christie will have no choice but to comply. Meanwhile, keep an eye on New Jersey's CDS. Already the riskiest state in the country, New Jersey's credit default swaps are set to blow out further in the coming weeks. And then you can see the first comment here. Easy fix, just raise taxes on everyone still there. So that's a, exactly how you go from billionaires to barrios. Uh, it starts off with, oh, well, we can just raise taxes and the rich will pay for everything. But as soon as you try to pin down the rich, you find out that they can squeak out of things very, very quickly. Now, it's very interesting that at the time that this is breaking, we have this Panama Papers story. Now, for any of you who are skeptical, and of course I'm skeptical, obviously I 
think this thing's a complete ruse. It's a scheme and a scam and a fraud put on by the U.S. government. Now, how deep does this onion go? How many layers are there? Uh, how deep is the rabbit hole? Well, probably very deep, considering here that a WikiLeaks leak is saying that it's a Soros-funded operation. So now I trust WikiLeaks about as far as I can throw them because I believe that both WikiLeaks and Anonymous are actually U.S. government operations to begin with. But so now you have WikiLeaks accusing the Soros Foundation of phonying up this thing. I, now, I don't know who's behind it, but I definitely think it's phony. Here's the story. WikiLeaks uh, tweeted, Putin attack was produced by OCCRP, which targets Russia and former USSR, was funded by USAID and Soros. On Wednesday, the International Whistleblowing Organization said on Twitter that the Panama Papers data leak was produced by the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, OCCRP, which targets Russia and the former USSR. The Putin attack was funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development and American hedge fund billionaire George Soros. WikiLeaks added saying that the U.S. government's funding of such an attack is a serious blow to its integrity. So there's the story. Uh, do I believe this Panama Papers thing? Well, yes, in the sense that all politicians are corrupt and all politicians are taking bribes and all politicians probably have offshore bank accounts. I would imagine that Angela Merkel has been paid a very large sum of money to betray her own citizens, as have many, many, if not all, politicians. But what's behind this Panama Papers thing? Uh, well, it's an attack against uh, the inside billionaires. Um, they're going to try to go after the money. Maybe there's going to be a Bernie Sanders presidency, and they're going to try to track down the billionaires. Maybe there's going to be a Trump presidency, and they're going to try to prosecute the corrupt politicians. But actually, probably the best bet that you could make is that that everything's just going to continue as it always has and uh, this is just a ploy that they're running. So what does it all mean? Well, there's far, far too much corrupt money out there uh, to hide, and they have to find ways of hiding the money because they're gonna try to tax it away. Uh, the whole world is now going down this barrio course uh, that's happening in Venezuela. You have a very, very small percentage of people who are in control of the vast amount of wealth, and then you have a very, very large percentage of people who are extremely poor. And uh, it seems to me that the plan is to try to foment some type of revolution or revolutionary push or at least political revolutionary change so that uh, the poor people gather together and decide that they need to take the money from the corrupt rich people. That's what seems to be behind this. Now, obviously, as the real billionaires try to flee from the situation, if you look at China, for example, where we have many billionaires, uh, you can look at the Vancouver, Canada property bubble and people have predicted that that would pop for the longest time. And even now the Canadian economy is pretty much collapsing, but that bubble is still not going down. And the reason why is because, as Zero Hedge is covered, uh, the Canadian real estate is an exit door for Chinese money. And in China, if you're a billionaire, uh, your life could be in jeopardy because... Uh, the stories of Chinese billionaires disappearing, being murdered, uh, being arrested, being executed, all their wealth being seized, they're fairly common. So the Chinese have a fairly large incentive to find ways to get their money and then themselves out of the country. And that's something we're going to see all around the world in various jurisdictions. We see this now with uh, the Tepper leaving New Jersey, heading to Florida. And uh, it's all of this; st these uh, patterns and trends are just going to continue to heat up, and that's what I believe is going to be the cause, uh, ultimately, of 
a explosion in physical precious metals because ultimately uh, they're really the only things that escape this wide net they're going to be casting. And then of course the cryptocurrencies, uh, they're also another thing that will escape the net of trying to catch the billionaires. And we'll talk to you next time.